Oh, you're going to take a picture? Right? <laughs> well, welcome to each of you. I'm delighted that you're here. Um, I'm John Merkel, and along with having the pleasure of teaching theology here, I also have the pleasure of directing the J. Philip Center for Interfaith Learning. And you can see on our, our new uh, banner there what our mission is all about. We facilitate dialogue and we promote understanding and friendship and civic engagement among people of different religions. So as you can see in the title, it's the J. Philip Center for Interfaith Learning. And we hold all types of events. We hold public events like this. Some of you may have been to the uh, art exhibit that we're sponsoring uh, over at St. Benedict's in the, uh, with the Fine Arts Department. And we had a big opening, a conference uh, on September 5th that opened that event. Um, and we have um, smaller scale events, such as dinner dialogues. And we take groups of students and others to mosques and synagogues and other houses of worship. So in a variety of ways, the J. Phillips Center is about promoting uh, intercultural and interfaith activity. And I have two really wonderful student workers for the second year in a row that are helping uh, me in this effort. So uh, sitting right, right here, Radate Lewy and Radate, why don't you? And, and, and Donica Simone, or Simonette. She, she hasn't decided how she's going to pronounce her last name. Right. So it is a real, so by the way, so if any of you are interested in getting involved with the J. Phillips Center, you can speak with me, but uh, you can also speak with these two uh, wonderful seniors. So um, I'm really thrilled to um, welcome today David Kruger back to Minnesota. Grew up on a farm not far from where the alleged Ken, uh, Kensington runestone was discovered. Um, he got a master's degree in theology at Princeton Theological Seminary. He then got a doctorate in religion or religious studies from Temple University, where my mother graduated in 1932. We'll talk about that. Uh, and um, afterwards. <laughs> and his areas of expertise are American religious history, violence and religion, myths, popular culture. It all comes together in this uh, presentation that he's going to do today and in the book that is for sale over here. That book, Myths of the Runestone, Viking Martyrs and the Birthplace of America. So they say they're in Alexandria, right? Um, so he's a scholar, an author, an educator, passionate about public history and about social justice. And you're going to hear that today. He works with the Dialogue Institute. Did you put that up there? Yeah, the Dialogue Institute at Temple University, where in particular he uh, facilitates for the Dialogue Institute tours of scholars who come to the United States from around the world, sponsored by our US State Department. At least it's being sponsored for the time being. Maybe the project is a little too small for somebody who might want to nix it. Oh, I shouldn't be saying this, this is too political. <laughs> but it's a very good program at the State Department that got started uh, a number of years ago, and hopefully it continues to go. Um, he has been a media and education consultant for, or is, I should say, for the Inside Out Prison Exchange Program, which sounds fascinating, but that's not the topic today. Um, he's been, um, and continues to be, online scholarly contributor to the Travel Channel and to the Science Channel. Um, and though he grew up on a farm in central Minnesota. He has come to love Philadelphia almost as much, maybe. <laughs> but you're, you're well suited for it. That's where I was born, by the way, but that's for another time. Uh, he, and, and he gives tours there. He's a certified tour guide. So uh, next time I'm in Philadelphia, I'm going to 
take a better tour than I've taken before by checking, you know, calling you. So anyway, I, I'm very delighted to welcome you here today. It's an honor to have you with us. And I know that uh, everybody here is looking forward as much as I am to your presentation. And as I mentioned, his book is over there. So um, know that you can, you can buy it from Charlie, right? Yep. OK. David Kruger, please. Thank you so much. It's really lovely to uh, be here uh, with all of you. Um, I, I've stayed multiple times at the Abbey Guest House um, on writing retreats and uh, took some kind of retreat time with my wife uh, a few different times as well. And uh, it's great to be back again. We had a lovely time this summer with our scholar cohort that came to St. John's uh, University. And the J. Phillips Center just did a tremendous job hosting this group of scholars from 16 different countries, from multiple religious backgrounds, and the, the J. Phillips Center did a really great job. So we're really thankful for this partnership between St. John's and Temple University and Minnesota and Philadelphia. I love seeing these worlds uh, interact. So tonight, why did you come here tonight? I'm just so curious about what motivated you um, to take a look at this topic. But let's jump in and we'll, uh, we'll talk about that later. There's a small town about two hours northwest of Minneapolis, maybe about 50 minutes from here, that claims to be the birthplace of America. At the center of the town, in the shadow of the local history museum, stands a 20 foot, 28 foot tall, brightly painted Viking statue made or manufactured in fiberglass. The Viking holds a shield with a bold assertion that uh, Alexandria is the place where the history of the United States began. It's an odd claim when one thinks of uh, uh, the origins of the nation. One thinks of places like Plymouth, Massachusetts, Jamestown, Virginia, or Philadelphia, Pennsylvania, where I'm from. But let's review the origins of this claim. The year was 1898, and as the story goes, Olaf Oman, a Swedish immigrant farmer living near the village of Kensington, was clearing his field, clearing trees to expand his farm field. He used a winch mechanism to pull them out of the ground, and in the roots of one of the trees was a slab of gray whack stone, about 30 inches long, 15 inches wide, 6 inches thick. Now, stones like this are the nemesis of Minnesota farmers, and they're typically cast aside to make room for the plow. And I certainly, as a farm boy, uh, I've picked my fair share of rocks out of the field. But this stone was different. There were strange symbols on its surface, and it didn't take long for the farmer and his immigrant neighbors to recognize the markings as runic letters from the written language of medieval Scandinavians. Omen had unearthed a rune stone. There are more than 6,000 rune stones scattered throughout the world, most of them in Sweden. Many still stand today along roadsides and other prominent places. Rune stones are not gravestones that mark a burial, they're actually memorial stones that commemorate the deaths of individuals, especially those who have died while traveling abroad. And as you can see in these photos, the physical appearance of the stone inscription on the far right uh, in uh, Omens Field bears no resemblance to the design of any other known rune stones in Scandinavia. And of course, I couldn't help but take a, a little selfie while I was in Sigtuna, Sweden uh, for a conference last week. All right, so here is uh, an English translation of the inscription. And, and every time I do this, I always feel like I should ask everybody to stand up for the reading of the gospel lesson or something <laughs> like, like that. Eight Swedes and 22 Norwegians on an exploration journey from Vinland westward. We had our camp by two rocky islets one day's journey north of the stone. We were, out, we were out fishing one day, and when we came home, we found 10 men red with blood and dead. A-V-M, save us from evil. We have 10 men by the sea to look after our ships, 14 days journey from this island. And here's the clincher, the year 1362. Hmm. 
if this inscription were what it claimed to be, the implications would be profound. It would be material proof, chiseled in stone, that Norsemen had traveled to Minnesota centuries ago, long before the voyages of Christopher Columbus, nearly 500 years before Minnesota became a state. It seemed that this runic inscription could change the history of the United States. But was this artifact really what it claimed to be? In 1899, shortly after the rune stone was unearthed, it was sent to language experts at the University of Minnesota and Northwestern University near Chicago. Due to language inconsistencies, they declared the inscription did not originate in the 14th century, but more likely, the 19th century. Additionally, the incisions on the stone appeared to be freshly cut, and the early conclusion was that the most probable source what came from the local community near the village of Kensington. The stone was returned to Omen's farm where it lay in obscurity for several years. That could have been the end of the story. Another 19th century hoax debunked. And there were many 19th century hoax. Uh, for example, the uh, Cardiff giant and the Davenport tablets. But then, Along came a Norwegian-born author, Yalmer Holand. Pretty, pretty cool name, Yalmer, right? Yeah. Holand first encountered the stone in 1907 while traveling around the Midwest collecting stories about Norwegian pioneers. Holand immediately recognized the stone's utility because he included it in his, he included the story of the Norsemen in his book, History of the Norwegian Settlements. The Norse exploration of Minnesota functioned as a type of prologue to his immigrant history. Holand acquired the stone and began a lifelong crusade to prove its truth, or perhaps truths. Holand sent the stone to be evaluated by a geologist. It went to another university to be evaluated by a language expert. He even dragged it to Europe to try to per persuade the Swedish and Norwegian scholars. But again, the evidence appointed to a 19th century origin. And let me stop here. I'm not going to say much more about the authenticity question because I don't want to speak outside of my area of expertise. Um, I'm, I'm an historian of American religion. If you want to pursue the questions of authenticity further, we have to, to look to, towards folks like Henrik Williams. Um, a runic specialist at Uppsala University in Sweden, or maybe Tom Tro, an archaeologist here in Minnesota, um, or others who are guided by the scientific method as they evaluate the artifact. So, enough on that. Let's not have the authenticity question distract us for some, some deeper questions to ask tonight. Back to Holland. Since the scientific community would not give him the answers he wanted, he changed his approach. And to do so, he drew upon skills he had honed prior to his work as an author. Holand's first career was as a traveling book salesman, and second, he aspired to be a novelist. He wrote in his autobiography entitled, My First 80 Years, he says, it's a pretty audacious statement on its own, right? When the novelist retires to his den and rubs Aladdin's lamp of his imagination, he enters a different world. This combination of salesmanship and storytelling were instrumental in his ability to persuade the public to embrace the truth or truths of the runestone. Through his charismatic rhetoric and ability to evoke deep emotional connection with his various audiences by addressing their anxieties and aspirations, Holand was able to produce a powerful, yet adaptable narrative, constructing an alternative American origin story that the US was founded by the sacrifices of Norse Christians in the 14th century in the upper Midwest. During the 1960s, a poll by the Minneapolis paper reported that 60% of Minnesotans believed um, uh, Holand's account. How did Holand managed to persuade the public. And what can we learn about 
the Minnesotans in the 20th century by how they talked about the runestone. So the purpose of this talk is to look at the runestone as a prism through which to understand how white Minnesotans have talked about and understood racial and religious identity. Now, of course, Scandinavians were the first to take an interest in the stone. Immigrants of this time period were fascinated by the Norse saga literature. They viewed Vikings as almost godlike figures and were inspired by their heroic voyages across the Atlantic from Iceland to Greenland and then to a land further west known as Vinland. In the words of one poet, because we are reminded of the sagas of old, we are proud of the land we forsook, can it be that the blood of the Vikings still flows in our veins like a still running brook? Norwegian immigrant writers like Rasmus Bjorn Andersen popularized notions that Norse explorers reached New England by the year 1000. And he published a book in 1877 called America Not Discovered by Columbus as a way to uh, uplift Leif Erikson as the true founder of America. And as a side note, we do know, of course, that Vikings did reach North America in Newfoundland at the Lonzo Meadows site. They found archaeological evidence that Vikings indeed were there for a period of about 30 years or, or so. But this was not known in the 19th century. This was mere speculation. So Holand used the Minnesota runestone to extend the reach of these Norse heroes to the place where immigrants tilled the ground and struggled to make a home in the Minnesota prairie. Holand titled one of his first books, Defending the Stone, Westward from Vinland, and it was his own effort to produce the latest volume of the sagas, a saga of the Norse in the American Midwest. Immigrants belong to Minnesota because their ancestors had prepared the way and made a sacrifice. Both Anderson and Holland use myths about the Norse as a homemaking strategy similar to other immigrant groups. The example of Cuban Catholics in Miami who brought the, the statue of Our Lady of Charity along with them from Cuba. There's a whole uh, mythology around that as well. But another immigrant homemaking strategy. However, these, these efforts at homemaking sometimes have a more pernicious side. Yalmer Holand used several strategies to, to prove that the Norsemen came to Minnesota in the 14th century. Um, boulders with holes drilled into them, uh, claiming to be places to anchor Viking ships, uh, swords and, and uh, battle axes that farmers would unearth and magically unearth in their fields and present to them. Um, all of these can be debunked. We won't, we won't get into that right now. But Holand also used the bodies and cultures of native people as additional proof. Since the 18th century, there have been observers who have speculated that about the possibility of contact between Europeans and the Mandan people of the upper Missouri River Valley, in North South Dakota. And French explorer uh, Laverendre La uh, commented in his journals that among the Mandan, some had blonde hair, light skin, and even blue eyes. They had also had permanent settlements and practiced agriculture. And outside observers like George Catlin popularized the theory that they were the descendants of the Welsh king Madoc, who in folklore uh, allegedly traveled to North America in 1170. So Holand saw an opportunity uh, among the Mandan, this, this image of the Mandan, to make his own conclusion. Holand claimed that the Mandan were the descendants of the surviving Norsemen who carved, who chiseled the inscription on the runestone. Holand said that the Mandan had, quote, superior intelligence and were the most civilized and hospitable tribe in the Americas. And this superiority, superiority where did it come from, says Holand? Well, it can only be attributed to, to them being partial descendants of surviving Vikings. Swedes and Norwegians are of the, quote, purest Nordic stock, said Holland. And even a few of them in a familial bloodline would be enough to make the Mandan so peaceful and so kind, unlike the other savages around them. Holland used the Mandan to bodies 
to bolster a notion of Scandinavian exceptionalism, a form of ethnic pride that excoriated um, another group. Holand's notion of Nordic superiority was in line with the dominant thinking of this era. This period was a peak time for immigration and new arrivals were coming from southern and eastern Europe. Earlier arrivals had come to the US from Great Britain, Germany, Scandinavia. The new arrivals also came from non-Protestant areas, meaning that Jews and Catholics were arriving in greater numbers. The Immigration Act of 1924, also known as the Johnson-Reed Act, placed new restrictions on immigration that greatly privileged arrivals from North and West Europe. According to the dominant beliefs of the day, Swedish Lutherans were far more desirable than Italian Catholics or Romanian Jews. It should be noted that the enthusiasm for the notion of Viking presence in North America was also of great interest to New England Yankee elites of, of the era. New England history books of the period often included Norse exploration as a prologue to the history of Massachusetts or Rhode Island. And uh, the, they pointed to evidence like the Dighton Rock and the Newport Tower. I can talk about that later if you're interested. And what explains for this interest? Why would the Boston Yankee elite be interested in a Nordic, uh, Nordic uh, mythology? And, uh, according to one historian, at a moment of increasing fear that the nation was committing race suicide, the thought of a Viking, a Viking ghost roaming the streets of the city increasingly filled the Irish, uh, fill, increasingly filled with Irish, Italian, and Jewish hordes must have been comforting to an Anglo-Saxon elite whose political power was decidedly on the wane. So a sense of racial anxiety. This was a period in which Leif Erikson statues and other Viking statues went up all over the US, including Boston. I think this picture is actually in St. Paul, uh, Minnesota. For many, the erection of such statues would be a way to claim a white space and even a Protestant space in American cities. Now that's a little bit of a silly claim, right? Because if you know anything about the Protestant Reformation, that happened like, you know, 1500 and later, <laughs> okay? Leif Erikson, of course, converted to Christianity and he would have been a Catholic, right? But in the minds of the, the New England elite, Leif Erikson just kind of seemed more Protestant than that Catholic Christopher Columbus, all right? Native people are not mentioned directly in the runestone inscription as we saw, but they are clearly projected into the text, read into it. They, and only they, could be the cause of the ten men to end up red with blood and dead. The interpretation of the inscription must be put into the context of one of Minnesota's essentially most uh, traumatic events of the 19th century, the Dakota War of 1862. Through a series of deceptive treaty practices signed under coercive conditions, Dakota people had essentially given away much of their homeland in the southern part of the state. By the summer of 1862, living conditions were dire and the U.S. government delayed payments to the Dakota people. Some Dakota men fought back they killed a number of settlers, perhaps 400, perhaps more white settlers were killed. Many were un unarmed. Um, it was a really tragic event. The U.S. military came in and intervened, um, put uh, Dakota men on trial. As many, four, as many as 400 were sentenced to death. In the end, 38 Dakota men were hung in the Mankato town square. And still, even to this day, this was the largest mass execution in U.S. history one of Minnesota's claims to fame. And the following season, virtually all Dakota people were forcibly exiled, removed from the state. So what does this have to do with the runestone? Constant Larson was a local historian and he, and he wrote a history of Douglas County and in his book he includes a huge section um, defending the runestone. You know, why would he 
you know, spent so much time on a book that talked about the history of Millersville Lutheran Church and other kind of mundane things in the region. Um, but if you look at the writings, you see that he makes a strong parallel between the, the quote, Viking massacre of 1362 and the white massacre of 1862. He refers to both Dakota people um, in the 19th century and the so-called Skralings, um, as a Norse word for native people, uh, refers to them both as savages. And the Vikings slash immigrants were portrayed as innocent. And Larson even goes further. Larson blames native people for the lack of economic growth of this rural uh, part of, of Minnesota during the 19 teens and 20s. And here's this is what he says. Douglas County has such a promising future, said Larson, but the Sioux outbreak had interrupted the course of empire. It took many years before the white man took over uh, control of the land and uh, no longer stood in relentless fur the relentless fury of the savages. So it's interesting that rather than blame unfettered capitalism, the trend of rapid urbanization, he decides to scapegoat the most vulnerable population in the state at the time. It was native people. It's their fault that our economy is in bad shape um, today. So in an overall sense, this uh, juxtaposition of the events of 1362 and 1862, and notice there's a convenient 500 year gap. It's a little suspicious. Um, this really was used as, a, as an ideology to help bolster the notion that white people had full claim to the landscape. And very briefly, this needs to be viewed, this is not just a Minnesota thing, this is much, a much part of a bigger trend uh, where there was an ongoing theory that um, either Egyptians or lost tribes of Israel or Phoenicians or other so-called superior civilizations had lived in North America and then they were either killed or wiped out or exterminated by um, the uh, barbarians who had come across the Bering Strait. So it was a way of constructing native people as somehow culpable for destroying mythical, made-up white people from the past that never really existed. It's kind of a really bizarre method. Um, but even um, President Andrew, Andrew Jackson appealed to that type of logic as he defended the Indian Removal Act of 1830. If you could prove that Native people were savage hundreds or thousands of years ago. You could make a better claim that they were that it was justified for them to be removed. So on to the religious piece, and I know our time is is short. Um, Holland was very savvy in using religious um, notions to bolster the claim uh, of support for his artifact, and he found this obscure letter in the Danish archives, which talked about King Magnus commissioning uh, a group under the leadership of Paul Knudsen to lead a, 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 a mission into, the North America, into Greenland to find a group of Norse colonists who had given up on the, the, the Christian faith. Um, the letter was from 1354. There's no proof that this mission was ever carried out. But this letter, this one document, became the narrative underpinning for his theory that he would promote in coming years. Now it's interesting, this religious turn, so to speak, um, inspired some very significant Minnesota uh, religious figures. And I think you'll recognize this gentleman here, right? Archbishop John Ireland. Archbishop Ireland attended one of Holland's famous runestone talks down in, at the Minnesota History Museum at the time. And, uh, he, you know, asking the question of like, why would he be interested in this Nordic artifact? Well, it really comes down to those three letters in the inscription, right? A, V, M, all right? To Ireland and Holland and many Catholics of the early 20th century, they recognize that as a reference to the Blessed Mother. So therefore, this was a prayer, a Catholic prayer, perhaps the first, uh, I've heard some descriptions of, this was the first religious utterance in North America, as if like native people didn't have their own religion, but uh, there was this kind of this reference of like, this is when religion began uh, with, the, with these Catholic uh, missionaries in this period. So, you know, uh, 
to, to put in a little bit of a context of why Ireland was interested, I think it was part a, a way to reach out to appeal to Scandinavian immigrants. I mean, those folks are mostly Lutheran, right, at this time. So maybe this would be a way to kind of like, hey, you know, uh, consider us as the original religion of, of, uh, of Scandinavia. And then secondly, I think more important, this was really part of a larger trend of Catholic historians during the early 20th century to be able to incorporate Catholic people into American religious history. I mean, if you read a lot of uh, the dominant history books of that period, it's all about, it all began with the Puritans, it all began with the Pilgrims, all these Protestants, right? Well, what about all these Catholics that were all over the place as well? So legitimately, um, Catholic historians wanted to draw attention um, to the presence of, of Catholics in early America, and the Runestone story was another uh, way to strengthen that claim. I have to tell you one uh, uh, interesting little story about how Holland was able to bring in more people into this narrative and to convince them. Um, there's a boulder, a collection, a kind of a long uh, U-shaped boulder near Sauk Center, Minnesota. That's not, not too far from here. And Holand got a, a letter from a local priest who said, you know, somebody found this boulder, it has some holes in, t in it, and I'm wondering, could you come out and take a look at it? Um, and Holand comes out, and typically the boulders with the holes were to indicate that this was next to a waterway, and the Vikings anchored their ship in the holes, and they chiseled them out with iron tools and so forth. But this was like nowhere near water, nowhere near it at all. At all. But never fear. Holand had an alternative theory for what those holes just might be. The two holes, the vertical holes, were obviously, uh, said Holand, as he had done some research before he arrived on the criteria that the Catholic Church had for constructing temporary places to host the Eucharist while you were traveling around the world. And he said those two vertical holes were used for poles to erect a tent over, over, this, over the site. And the two horizontal holes were meant for holding dowels to hold a table for, just for, for, for placing the Eucharistic elements. And, and clearly, he said, uh, this looks just like a church chancel, does it not? And you could just kind of hear the priest saying, like, yeah, Professor Holand, that sounds like a, a pretty great theory to us. You know, you could see this temptation to get kind of taken into this story because Holand could tell these just these captivating stories that would draw upon your own um, uh, aspirations and desires and will. So a claiming an, of a Catholic American space. So John, we're getting close to the time, right? Take a little bit more time before we open it up. Okay, so maybe five more minutes. I'll try to t tighten this down a little bit more. So uh, here's another lovely picture from Sister Mary Christine. I think she has some ties to the Central Minnesota Diocese, and she produced this sketch in 1950s, I think. Um, really evocative image, and I can, I can put it back up on the screen later to we can look at it more, more carefully. Um, but she um, called this the Blessed Mother as Our Lady of the Runestone. And there's a church near Kensington, Minnesota that, that carries that name, Our Lady of the, of the Runestone. Uh, it's really, really imaginative, I think. Um, so taking us into the 1950s, and this is the last section that I wanted to just to really briefly get at. During the 1950s, this narrative of a, uh, uh, played some role in larger conversations about the United States being founded as a Christian nation. So two quick stories. In 1958, Minnesota celebrated the state centennial, and the local newspaper had an edition dedicated to the centennial and the local church history. And a local guy named Mr. Robb uh, wrote an article titled, Douglas County's most famous relic. And Rob uh, admonishes the readers to remember that the true motivation of the Norsemen was to, um, they came not in search of gold, but for the glory of God and salvation of men. They had been commissioned by King Magnus to restore the Christian faith to a lost colony of backsliders. So, and then a quote of how he describes the scene. Between the Viking lines, we, we can hear the whoops and see the onrush of savages, their copper torsos gleaming in sweat and paint, the feathers of the eagles streaming from their scalp locks. We can shudder with them, with him who wrote what he saw, red with blood and dead. 
Rob goes on, Magnus, King Magnus was a fanatically, quote, fanatically militant Catholic who was, quote, alive with the zeal to spread the gospel. Rob admires the faith of the Norsemen because they were, quote, willing to convert unbelievers at the sword's point if necessary. Wow. Another example of the utility of the story came with a debate around the inclusion of a cross on a public symbol uh, that was the state centennial symbol. There was a raging debate around uh, if you include the cross, would Jews and other religious minorities feel like they weren't really part of Minnesota? Um, and if you left it off, were you denying this kind of dominant presence that Christianity played? Really contentious debate. And religious leaders weighed in, like Catholic Archbishop William O'Brady. He said that, you know, Jews should not feel like the cross was an affront. Um, and that he would defend Jews in times of persecution. But then he went on to say this. He said that atheists, agnostics, and the ACLU had no business <laughs> protesting the cross because they were not present when Minnesota was founded. And he went on to say, if today's pressure removes the cross from the emblem that marks the past, tomorrow's pressure will tear it from our churches and our homes. Now, it's not known if Brady directly referenced the runestone narrative, but another Lutheran minister named Reverend Preuss certainly did. He described the Viking explorers of men of religion whose earnest prayer was the first uttered by white men in the state. And it recorded on this, and the artifact proved that the church, uh, that, that Minnesota was founded as a Christian state in a Christian nation. So, oh, sorry. Uh, what is to explain for this militant language and this pervasive fear? This was the heart of the Cold War, and maybe some of you remember some of this language of it's, you know, we're in a battle between a Christian America and an atheistic communist movement. There's this notion of a cosmic battle going on, and it explains some of the militarism in the language. And also there was a growing fear of secularization. This language of backsliding, turning away from the faith, giving up on the faith. And uh, it needs to be put in context of, of uh, some fears around, uh, uh, de demographically, looking at some poll polling data, uh, people were seeing religion as less influential in society during this period. And there were Supreme Court cases which ended teacher-led public prayer in public schools and teacher-led Bible reading in public schools. And people started to get really panicking about like, oh my, oh my goodness, you're taking God out of the schools and out of the public square. Um, so there was a certain level of uh, anxiety around, um, around that type of thing. So let me just move ahead to the final discussion points that hopefully can frame our conversation. Uh, first of all, some things that we can learn about the Runestone story, and here's the, the first thing. Never underestimate the power of stories and narratives to overwhelm scientific and factual claims. All right? There's a lot, a lot of things to talk about in that. Secondly, I think this is a cautionary tale about ethnic or religious slash denominational pride. Um, as it's often been the case in US history, a group that was once marginalized and then they gained social power they often use their newfound po power to you know, keep bolstering their own privilege and marginalize others. You think of Catholics absolutely experience persecution greatly throughout many points of American history. But then you have the archbishop saying like, wow, Minnesota is only for these certain kinds of people and not other kinds of, of, of people. And Scandinavian Americans, um, saying that uh, they had full, they had no um, uh, responsibility to, to treating Native people in a, in a better light. And then third, origin claims and foundation myths, they wield a tremendous amount of power in a society. If you can claim like you began something, if you founded something, um, it's really kind of an, it's a very powerful, power-driven kind of a, of a narrative. You know, if you, can demonstrate that America is a founded as a Christian nation and 
uh, for Christians only. Um, th these types of claims are often uh, ways of defining who belongs and who does not belong. The role, so we can talk about the role of origin myths. Um, third, or fourth, in times, I think the Runestone story suggests that in times of crisis, national crisis, social crisis, even if the crisis is kind of like manufactured crisis, it's often minorities, it's often the vulnerable in society that become targeted as the people to blame for the crisis that is taking place in the society. It's a, it's a, it's a, uh, a thing that we see again and again throughout U.S. history. Um, there's more I could say about the, the links to white supremacist movements today, the obsession among white supremacist groups to to look for claims that white people or Europeans or proto-Europeans were somehow in North America prior to Columbus. We could talk about that, but hopefully those can be some talking points to get us started. Thank you very much. So there's a microphone right here and one over there, and I invite whoever would like to raise a question or offer a response um, to go to the mic. Gary Osberg, please. My name is Gary Osberg from Uppsala, Minnesota. <laughs> All right. And uh, well, I've always considered uh, what I heard about the Vikings that they were rapers and pillagers. I don't understand this link with Christianity as being logical or even hearsay. Yeah, it's it's interesting. I mean, um, you know, we're, when we're talking about the Viking Age, we're talking about the time period of roughly. 8th century up to about 1066 is known as classically the end of the Viking Age, the end of the, of the, the attacking and stealing and theft and pillaging. So when Runestone supporters talk about Vikings, it's, it's not, not historical period because 1362 was the Viking Age was long, long over. But to be fair, Holand, when he did talk about the Norse, he would, auction, he would always use the term Norseman and not Viking. But that, but that image of Viking is such a kind of a tantalizing, romantic kind of thing, like many folks in the community uh, attached to that word. In the 19th century, uh, the Swedes and the Norwegians in Minnesota weren't exactly on friendly terms, were they? There, there was conflict uh, over the, the rule of who was ruling who at, at what time. And I think there was also a little bit of a cult, kind of a cultural uh, debate as well, um, almost like a class tension between the two of them, because Norwegians tended to come from these rural fjords. They tended to be very isolated, rural communities, and when Norwegian immigrants came to the U.S., they often gravitated towards North Dakota, like out in, you know, out in the, the rural areas. Whereas Swedes, there's a higher percentage of them gravitated towards cities. So there was kind of like a higher class Swedes and lower class Norwegian kind of a thing going on as well. And then, of course, the political history tensions as well. And I, I think it was typically, as, as I've observed, it tended to be the Norwegians who were the most vehement supporters of, of the runestone. And I think more Swedes were skeptical. Perhaps maybe they were better educated in urban centers, a different type of way of encountering the world. So. Uh, could you say a little bit more about the Dakota conflict and yeah. the trauma that was inflicted on the um, Scandinavian community and then how that shapes your ideas about their wanting to reach back into time to claim the space as the Minnesota space, for example, as theirs. Yeah, I mean, it was a, it indeed was a very traumatic experience, obviously for the Dakota, since they were physically forcibly removed from the state, but it, there also is that trauma among the survivors. Many of these pioneers had uh, established a homestead and they simply, after that summer of 1862, they evacuated. If they weren't killed, they just simply evacuated. I'm too scared to go back. Um, and if you read some of the local newspaper accounts of the day, there was a great deal of resentment among the local, local population that more of the Dakota men were not executed. Um, President Lincoln intervened in these, these really sham military tribunals and said, look, you can't execute 400 people. 
um, and they got it down to 30, 38 on the certain, certain kinds of criteria. And if you read the local newspaper accounts, there was a lot of anger about that. Like, these folks really, really needed to be punished. We needed to kill as many of them as they killed of, uh, of us. Um, so there was a great deal of anger, certainly trauma, <laughs> you know, um, and a desire to exact revenge. And, 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 I, and I would argue that this type of resentment just kind of, if it's not dealt with, if you don't process it, if you don't heal it, if you don't come to sense of resolution, it kind of stays in your psyche and can get passed on to the next generation. And I think uh, um, folks in the early 19th century, they perhaps maybe felt guilt for the plight of Native people. Some may have felt some guilt. And perhaps this runestone story helped to assuage the guilt because it helped to kind of bolster their claim, like, oh, the Indians, they really deserve what they got. Um, and this story helps us to, to come to terms with that. So I don't know. I'd love to explore the question uh, more. But trauma manifests itself in some very dangerous ways. Could I have a follow-up question that's sure. actually on a slightly different point that you mentioned about that you're talking about the history of Douglas County. Yeah. Um, and there were so many of those uh, written in the Upper Midwest. There's a whole industry of writing these county histories. That's right. And have you looked at other county histories in Minnesota, and do they also talk about the runestone, I guess the ones written after, obviously, the discovery. Yeah, I, I, there was kind of, as I understand, there was kind of like a formulaic way of organizing these, these books. I have not studied in detail. I think the history of Grant County, I also looked at that one, and I think the runestone story played a role in that one as well. Um, but it's a great question. I'd love to, to do kind of a comprehensive study to see if anybody else mentioned it as well. But it definitely was a Douglas County, Douglas County and Grant County thing for sure. You said uh, Yalmer Holland convinced 60% of Minnesota that the stone was real and that Alexandria was the origin of the United States. How do you think so many people denied the scientific claims against that? Yeah, and, and that's that's really the question to keep to keep wrestling with. Um, as I said, Holland could tell such a compelling story. He told a narrative that really spoke to people's you know, fears, hopes, aspirations, anxieties. And if you can tell a really good story, facts be damned. I mean, we see, see that taking place today <laughs> in many ways. Um, but I think that, that we also need to and, and because I'm not, a, I'm not a scientist, but I hang around with people who do science. Um, I had a dinner with uh, an archaeologist last night who's very much involved in this uh, uh, conversation. And I really pressed him. I said, you know, I see all these articles with scientific proof and all this, this evidence and piles of articles and facts and all that kind of thing. It's very bewildering to an average citizen. Like you can't, like a typical person can't just look at a pile of data and come to a conclusion. Scientists and science, science communicators need to do a better job at teaching the public, educating the public about what is involved in making a scientific argument. What does peer-reviewed research look like? How do you distill down points into a way that people can actually engage it? So I think there's the onus is on the scientific community to, to be better communicators. Hello. I, ha I wanted to double check on something I heard. So you mentioned how the economy declined between roughly 1910 and 1920 or something like that? Yeah, it was kind of a post-World War I uh, boom. During the First World War, uh, farmer, the farm economy was, was right. you know, because there was, they had to grow a lot of grain to feed the troops. There was a huge dip in right. the agricultural economy after that. Right. Well, actually, I've been... I'm, doing a history of this, and there's oh, okay. actually a boom in Minnesota up through about 1910, where Minnesota's income is far above the national average, I and then see. it collapses between 1910 and 1920 to be below 90 percent, actually about 85 percent. Oh, really? So, I mean, it's really this, oh. this decade-long, maybe even 15-year-long drop, and so I was wondering, because oh, okay. that's intriguing what you're saying, is that here's some sociological, historical evidence that this had a big impact. Yeah. That people understood that this was something nasty going on. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, he, this, this book, Larson's book was published in 1916. 
So I guess that would make that would make more sense. The was, industry in Minneapolis, for example, was collapsing. Is that right? Even though the war was creating a boom for the demand for wheat, uh -huh. Minneapolis milling industry was losing out to other places, and so people were losing oh. jobs by the dozens. Okay. So, yeah. Yeah. So then to be able to see, like, sense. yeah, thank you for for that. No, that, I, I've never heard yours, so thank you. Yeah. Great. <laughs> Where is the rune stone now? Well, it's located in Alexandria, Minnesota. Some Alexandria businessmen purchased the rune stone from Yalmer Holland for $5,000. And it is, was purchased by the Chamber of Commerce. So the rune stone museum is right next to the Chamber of Commerce. And that would suggest to me that the local economic industry has a great deal invested in this stone drawing attention and drawing the tourist industry to, to the region. And when you walk into the museum, and some of you have been to, to the museum, um, you open these kind of doors that open up, and in the middle is the rune stone perched on this pedestal with plexiglass all around it. There are spotlights trained on it. It's as if you were walking into an inner sanctum of a religious space. It's, it's really remarkable uh, to see it. Among certain uh, white supremacist groups, North's mythos seems to be prominently featured. Yeah. I'm wondering in what ways is the rune or this foundation, like founding fathers or founding Vikings myth, is it operative among white supremacist groups, do you know? Or how is the myth functioning today? So this is one area that I have not spent a tremendous amount of time in looking specifically for reference, because I guess I just don't hang out on white supremacist websites and bl blogs and forums that much. Maybe I ought to for the sake of research. That's probably something I need to do. Um, but I know that if you visit the Southern Poverty Law uh, 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 list of hate groups throughout the US, you will see a number of groups known as the, uh, oh, I wrote them down here, the uh, Vinlanders Social Club. Vinland is a metaphor for uh, Norse presence in North America. You'll find the Wolves of Vinland, the Soldiers of Odin. Um, there's this one particular group named uh, the Asatru Folk Assembly. Uh, now, to be careful, there are heathen and pagan religious revival movements that are not racially white supremacist at all. They're just simply practicing the traditional religious practices. But there is a minority and a vocal minority that really does appeal to Norse and pagan mythology. Um, so yeah. I think some more research needs to be done, and maybe I maybe I ought to do that. Yeah. So you said, so you said there were um, like multiple other stones that were mainly found in Sweden. I think were there any, actually any other any others found in Minnesota? Uh, there were a couple of others. There was the Chokayo. There's a town called Chokayo near nearby here, right? Chokayo altar stone. A, a, a woman uh, found a rock with some runic writing on it. The local priest uh, came by and verified that this was a more evidence for the Viking altar rock. This was actually the table where the, Nor where the Norse Vikings had uh, uh, placed the Eucharistic elements. That was quickly disproved. Um, there's another runestone in Oklahoma called the Hevener, uh, Hevener runestone. Um, again, pretty much uh, they, they found, they, they analyzed the writing and it refers, it's a coded way of referring to a neighbor who lived like a mile away or something like that. So these things do pop up in the American landscape, uh, but the Kensington Runestone is by far the most famous. Uh, yeah, so I'm from St. Peter, Minnesota, which is uh, where Gustavus Adolphus College yeah. is, and is obviously very proud of the, the Norwegian, um, or not not as much Norwegian, Scandinavian and the Swedish heritage with yep. the three crowns and everything. So. Um, but I know St. Peter's not unique in, in that the other side of town is a church named after John Ireland and uh -huh. the Catholic side and uh -huh. um, a lot of you know, Irish heritage, a lot, a lot of uh, um, MC names in St. Peter as well. Uh -huh. um, and uh, so I was kind of curious what, how, what your thoughts are on how this history has contributed to kind of the budding of heads of Protestants and Catholics in, in a lot of these you know, rural Minnesota towns, or n not even necessarily rural, but just kind of throughout the history of Minnesota. Well, as far as like the rune stone, how it impacted the, that, those relationships, or you're asking more? Yeah, that? just kind of like with, you know, like with the Viking history and the Norwegian immig immigration and, and kind of what you were getting at with the anxieties of, of, um, of different religions mm -hmm. kind of in, in close proximity with each other and uh -huh. how, kind of how that has affected Minnesota. 
Yeah, I mean, I think that, you know, so I, I currently live in Philadelphia and I've traced a lot of the history of, uh, you know, it was founded as more of a Protestant city by Quakers, act, actually, and then there were Methodists and Baptists and Presbyterians, and then there was a huge wave of Catholic immigration to, to Philadelphia. And uh, Irish Catholics came to Philadelphia in the 1830s and 1840s in huge numbers, and the tension got to be so um, uh, intense that uh, a bunch of Protestant nativists um, started a riot in a Catholic neighborhood and ended up burning down two churches, killing about 15, 20 people in the neighborhood. Um, and there was a lot of you know, urban hand-to-hand -hand combat in urban centers. I don't know of any like outbreaks of actual physical violence between Protestants and Catholics in Minnesota that I'm aware of. Um, but I think it took a long time for Catholics to actually, like I don't think Minnesota got its first, first Catholic governor until maybe the 1980 or something like that, Rudy Perpich, if I'm not mistaken. Um, so Scandinavians kind of, kind of had a kind of a dominant uh, role in Minnesota culture, because at least from the outside, there's a stereotype like Minnesota, oh, it's just all Swedes and Norwegians. But you forget about this huge German Catholic population. I mean, Catholics had a very, very prominent uh, place in Minnesota history, and that's often kind of forgotten by a lot of history. So I don't know if that's answering your question very well, but uh, uh, the Kensington Runestone, it's interesting that uh, it created this little moment, or like little moments here and there where you had you know, S Swedish Lutherans and German Catholics kind of rallying around this one artifact, and they both invested in the stone, but for entirely different reasons. So it kind of provided this, these little moments of linkages, which I think is really interesting. Oh, I'm right here. Um, you talk a little bit about um, immigrant my um, anxiety that happened with Norwegian um, versus um, Italian Im um, migrants that came in, and you talk about like their religion, like with the Italians, they were more um, ca um, Catholic, with the Norwegian, they were Lutheran, there was a preference for the Norwegian. Can you please expand on that? And also, did that have any effect on like the um, stone, the ruin? But, um, so, yeah, I mean, as I said, like during the that Immigration Act of the 19, 1924, there, you know, were uh, the way that they configured the, uh, it was a national origin quota that they set up that said um, only a certain percentage, like if you came from Sweden, we will accept this number of people as a percentage of the larger population. Um, but if you came from Italy, we would only accept like this percentage of the population. So it was a formula that really was heavily biased towards Northern and Western uh, Europeans, that this was the view it was largely religious, I think, because Protestants were fearing that, oh man, Jews and Catholics, they're having more political power, they have different values. These Catholics, oh man, they, they come to America, I mean, are they really like loyal to the president, or are they, do they follow the Pope in Rome, and all this kind of attitude? And this anxiety around immigration, of course, we still have seen it, we see it today. Like, what are the groups today um, that are mistrusted, that are often viewed as not fully capable of, of embracing American values. So, you know, I love the United States. It's been a country that has welcomed diverse groups, especially diverse religious groups. And I'm from Pennsylvania, you know, a state founded by William Penn, the Quaker, who created this colony that was embracing of all these minorities during a time period where that was considered weird um, during colonial America. Um, so I think the U.S. and U.S. history, we have this on one hand, we welcome, which is awesome, which is great, but on the other hand, there's always like this, this fear and trust of new groups. Can they really fit in? Do they really embrace the, uh, what it means to be a, a true American? So, yeah. Sure. Yeah. So, did you find any evidence of Native American tribes like using their own mythos or oral histories to like try and defend themselves against these allegations? Um, you know, I think I, I, I primarily did the research on, as a study of kind of an ethnography of white folks, you know, looking at how they thought. Um, I did reach out to several Native scholars as I was writing it, and nobody that I talked to had found anything um, uh, the written by Native people. I mean, cer certainly there would have been people talking about it. I have one picture, I don't think I can get to it fast enough, 
but in 1938, Alexandria hosted a history pageant, a local history pageant. And in the newspaper articles, they, they brought a group of Ojibwe, uh, Anishinaabe uh, men and women from the Cass Lake Reservation in northern Minnesota. And they actually participated in a runestone uh, play that dramatized the Viking massacre. You know, I, I just find that really, really interesting. Like, why would Native people participate in that type of a public ritual where they are obviously cast as the, um, the bad guys? But, I mean, you know, there was also uh, the wild, uh, Buffalo Bill Cody used to have these traveling Wild West shows, and even uh, Sitting Bull, I think, um, after he was defeated at one battle, he he uh, actually chose to go along and play along, to play Indian, so to speak, uh, for these audiences. So uh, more research needs to be done on that. But uh, uh, yeah, I would like to, to find out more about how Native people responded. Thank you. Yeah, I think uh, one of the few uh, bright lights uh, in, uh, during the, uh, the uh, Dakota U.S. Uh, war or conflict was uh, Bishop Henry Benjamin Whipple, yes. the Episcopal Church. Right. He was one of the few people that that genuinely was with the Dakota people. Although right. uh, Whipple himself was uh, naive um, in, in being able to understand the richness of, of right. Dakota uh, stories right. and heritage, but. Whipple went to Washington and he saw President, President Lincoln. And as he uh, right. visited President Lincoln, Whipple said that he got uh, President Lincoln, um, he got his ear to the point that uh, That's right. Lincoln shook all the way down to the bottom of his boots. Hmm. But the Civil War, the Civil War um, had detracted uh, so much attention right. away from what was happening in uh, out here in Minnesota. Yeah, and and those are just the the perfect kinds of stories that we need to to teach. I mean, we have kind of like these dominant narratives about what happened, but we need to really be about the work of uplifting stories like that, like what it takes for a person of conscience to intervene, to stand up, to speak against the powers that be. And Bishop Whipple was not a popular guy. He was seen as like a race traitor, a white, a traitor to the white, to white people for, for engaging in that kind of uh, reaching across in that way. But we need more stories like that. I just wanted to confirm, did you say that the Beef Erickson statues went up across the US in the 1920s? I'm sorry, no, the 1870s, 80s, 90s, I, probably some in the 1920s and early 20th century, but, um, that was kind of the heyday of the, the statues going up. And what do you think that they reflected at the time? What did they mean to the people who were putting them up? Well, it, you know, I, I really, the, the, the civic leaders, like I, I used the, the Boston example in, in particular, like these were, there weren't hardly any Scandinavians in Boston at all. Like why the heck would they be interested in, you know, Leif Erikson? And, but, but as I was saying, like, he kind of had this aura of, of being more of a Protestant Christian, being a part of a racial group that was perceived by the New England elites to be superior, kind of an Anglo-Saxon identity. Because Boston in the 1880s, there were a lot of Italian uh, Catholic immigrants coming to the city. Um, Jews were coming to the city in large numbers. And a lot of the elite were like, man, these are these low-class people that are coming here with these foreign ideas. Um, but Leaf, you know, maybe we can go back and reclaim the sense of America being founded by Protestant, Anglo-Saxon, uh, Nordic types of people. So uh, there's been a lot of research about, you know, you know, looking closely at some of this language. And um, Mancini was the scholar that I that I referred to. She has a really nice article that looks very carefully at this kind of uh, Yankee enthusiasm for Vikings during that time period. But there's a lot of uh, there's a lot of good material out there on that. I grew up in Ottertail County, mm -hmm. close to um, a lake that my brothers would explore 
not on our farm, but they would find a, a rock with a hole in it yep. and came home and told us about that. And yep. of course, it was probably in the 50s at the time when sure. we would think that the Vikings moored there. Right, right. Yeah, yeah. It's, it's so interesting. Yalmer Holand, as he writes his, his arguments, he identified 13 mooring stones. That's what they were called, holy boulders, which in a way became holy boulders, sacred boulders in a way. Uh, he counted 13 of them, and it, it followed a particular trail. And they, all these stones were, were spaced out all, uh, basically around like one day's journey travel between each of them. So he had this, this lovely, perfect na uh, narrative and this map that he created with all the spots where all the Vikings went in Minnesota. Um, but what Holin didn't tell you is there are actually hundreds and hundreds of these holy boulders all throughout the Minnesota landscape. I talked to uh, Tom Tro, an archaeologist, last night, and he's done research, and he found like evidence of 600 of them. They're like all over the place. Um, and basically, they were drilled out often um, to receive a stick of dynamite, and these boulders were blown up to provide foundation stone for buildings. It was typically uh, the primary use of the, these, these, these stones. Thank you for the talk. Mm -hmm. um, I have one quick comment and then somewhat unrelated uh, question. So the, the, the comment would be about um, why these Nordic figures might be taken up in a place like Boston as, yeah. as some kind of ideal. And I wonder if one could tie it back to the Greek tradition of a, of a figure called the Hyperborean, who is from ab above Boreas, above the northern winds. Uh -huh. um, and it's, an, it's a utopian type uh, figure and group that that had a perfect existence, but somehow beyond yet to the north. So I, I don't know the Greek traditions for it, but yeah. in the German tradition, a poet like Hilderlin would refer to them, uh -huh. Nietzsche would refer to them. So it's a it's a northern utopia called the Hyperborean, and I wonder if that gets glommed onto Leif Erikson as some kind of yeah. figure like that be worth looking into maybe. Yeah, that's a really great question. I don't know the, the different types of, uh, I, I haven't read a lot of the original writings of this, the boosters. I mean, you can have access to that material of like reading newspaper articles and you know, promotional materials to say like, hey, we're raising money for the Leif Erikson statue. And you'll probably find some clues about that. Uh, but yeah, I'd like to know more. And then the other quick question is just uh, wondering if anyone is working on, uh, as a transplant here from Cleveland, uh -huh. next year the Cleveland baseball team will get rid of its chief Wahoo uh -huh. um, uh -huh. insignia. And I'm always looking, looking at these types of things too. And I wonder when the Vikings were named as this team. Um, it's not the Tigers, it's not the Marlins, it's the Vikings. And I wonder if anyone's working on that and why they were named that. Well, it's, it's fairly straightforward. I mean, it, uh, they were named in 1962, and our friend Hans, uh, his grandfather apparently had a role to play in offering the name to the purse to the owner of the team at the time in 1962. But the background to that is the Minnesota Vikings name was chosen really in part, what I've read and what I've heard, it's kind of a nod to the, this kind of dominant Nordic culture of the state. You know, kind of leaves the Catholics out in, in, in a way, um, but and Germans and Irish and, and others. But I think it was part of that, like a nod to this dominant culture. Um, and I think definitely part of this kind of Holland's runestone mythology that, that he created. And I haven't found direct links to it, but 1962, that was a peak year for belief in the Kensington runestone in Minnesota, according to my data. Anyone want to ask one last question? When I first uh, went to the Kensington Runestone Shrine in Alexandria, I was struck by the sort of aura that reminded me of the Mormon tabernacle. Everything's mm. designed to get us to believe in it. And the ticket seller looked at me straight up when I handed her my, my dollars that contributed to Alexandria's uh, economy. Um, it's all true. And she gave me this look like you're a really bad person if you don't believe in it. So as a... I know the exact woman you're referring to as well. <laughs> She's my neighbor. 
my, my parents' neighbor. <laughs> well, good. well, as a uh, native of the greater Kensington, Alexandria area, I'm just wondering if, if this is sort of something you grew up with or that you sensed around the general area that this is, uh, you need to be kind of a believer and if so, now when you go back to that area, do you need to go incognito? <laughs> <laughs> well, I'll give you a hint. My book is not sold, to my knowledge, at the museum or any bookstore around the county, and I, I keep checking. Um, so when I was growing up, born in 72, um, 70s, 80s, was kind of a low point in belief in the runestone. Um, a couple of books, Theodore Blegin and another book had come out that had ba basically kind of debunked it and a lot of people kind of forgot about it. It just became kind of a silly part of the local folk folklore. But belief in the runestone really has risen greatly since about the year 2000 when a pr person with promotional interests um, kind of adopted it and kind of projected some new theories on it saying it was chiseled by Knights of Templar and other types of uh, theories that he uh, uh, has, has come up with and has trafficked, and it's become much more popular uh, very, very recently. Um, so I do remember when one of my first book talks in Alexandria, I, I gave one, one talk and, and spoke to one woman who was college educated, smart woman, um, business person, and after I kind of told her the story, she literally started to tear up. And it was as if I had told her that God is not real or something like that. It was almost at that type of a level. Like it was so kind of ingrained in her belief system. And to be told that, you know, because of science, because of something else undermined that, she was kind of shaken up, which I was really su su surprised by that. Um, so just having a college education and being a really smart person doesn't mean that you can't be taken in by a really, really great story. So, yeah, very interesting phenomenon. Thank you. Thanks to all of you for being here, and thank you so much, David, for really such an enlightening um, presentation, leaving us with so much to think about, not only about this particular myth, this story, but how so many of us are given to just what you were talking about there at the end, unexamined faith. Mm. And so a plug for liberal arts colleges where we can examine faith and all other types of things. Mm -hmm. thanks, mm -hmm. thanks again. Thank you. All right.